Thanks, Doug. I wanted to thank um, Ben and um, Doug Deacema for putting together a terrific program again, and I'm really honored to be included in, in the lineup this year. Um, I know you're eager to get out into the sunshine, so um, I just thought what I would do is try to bring things sort of full circle and talk about those kids that don't have families. Um, my work is primarily with orphans and vulnerable children, um, and so let me just tell you where I'm going to take you for the next few minutes. Um, I wanted us to consider, in the scheme of things, a number of the questions we've been thinking about for the last couple of days, but in the context of those children who don't have that support system, who don't have a stable family base, or even an imperfect um, family base from which to um, make decisions uh, regarding their health care and, and otherwise. And I also want to follow suit in looking at the developmental data specifically for these kids who have either been institutionalized or have um, been in and out of the fostering system. Um, I think it's a, an exciting turn in bioethics that pediatric bioethics is being increasingly informed by the, these data. Um, and so I just want to highlight um, the data that, that informed this particular population. Um, and then I want to look at the key features that I think ought to shape an ethical framework for how we ought to think about these kids. And I, and I don't use that as an abstract kind of academic um, definition of a framework or theoretical sense of a framework, but really what system of principles, um, guidelines, uh, et cetera, can help, help shape our um, support of these kids in the clinic, in the clinical encounter, as Leslie was talking about, um, in policy, in intervention programs, in global health. So it's very practically um, minded. And I want to start by um, calling uh, Doug's rattlesnake and raising him a herd of angry mother elephants. Um, this was in northern province, and we were actually on a walking safari, and I had a, a crappy digital camera from Gatwick, <laughs> so I didn't have a telephoto. And this will stay in my mind as one of the most sort of intimidating natural encounters I've ever had. I haven't, I haven't uh, had a close encounter with a rattlesnake, but this did it. Um, and, and the guide who was walking with us said, this is, he said later, we weren't talking at the time. <laughs> he said, this is the mother's club. And so this is a group of all female elephants, and they're young. And so it's sisters, an aunt, um, they take in, he knows this herd well, an orphan in the mix. And the two in the middle, the teen and her little baby sister, um, were extremely curious about us, and we represented danger, and they kept trying to sort of, I mean, this, this lasted for about 40 minutes, um, and they kept trying to peek out. And every time they did, those two in the front would body slam each other, and you felt this rumbling of the ground, and they would sort of back off. And it was a very powerful image of the way in which um, this particular community was taking care of its young. And I really can't, can't leave dads out of the picture. So as a former uh, teenage girl, uh, I just want to underscore the power of the, of the death stare. Um, this was another, <laughs> when you've missed your curfew and um, you know, it's, you're out with the new boyfriend and you get the look from dad, or worse, the boyfriend gets the look from dad. I, I lost a couple that way. Um, <laughs> hi, dad. I'm, I'm sure he's going to watch this. Um, and, and there's something really, really important about life's corrections that you just don't appreciate until you've got a little bit of distance from them. So I'd like us to, to spend a few minutes um, thinking about the way in which families are so central um, to raising children, not just in the context of healthcare, but really, I've, I'm taking a kind of World Health Organization lofty view of health, that it includes well-being, that it includes um, physical, mental, psychological health, and it includes all of these skills and um, social skills that people have been talking about for the last two days. Um, it's both a responsibility and a right of parents and families, and I use families in, I think, a cross-cultural sense, which is a lot of people don't appreciate that there's a long, long centuries, long tradition of informal extended fostering throughout much of Africa. Um, predates HIV AIDS. Um, and so the idea of a family as an extended supportive network I think is really critical. And yet for these teens, it's, it's still treated as, as a luxury, as something we can't hope to recreate. 
All around Lusaka, you see this artwork, and it's relatively recent. You also see official signs from the government that say, do not feed the street children, or do not give them change. Um, it only encourages them, and it's on you know, a big post at a major intersection. This question would have been moot uh, about 10 years ago. No one would, would think to ask whose responsibility are the street children. This is something that only comes up when this very rich, stable, centuries-old tradition of the extended family mentoring, fostering network breaks down. And so it's really striking and heartbreaking to see this artwork around, to see these signs around. Because what it says is that places throughout Central Africa, and I highlight the, the data from Zambia here, um, even just a few years ago, that network was functioning. So in 2000, as recently as 2002, 90% of the orphans from HIV AIDS were taken in by some family member in that extended family structure. Um, and just in, in these few short years, you've seen that um, halved, if not, if not worse, in, in certain um, subsections of, in the urban parts of, of Lusaka and surrounding areas. Um, Botswana as well is another example where you've just seen the informal fostering system completely overwhelmed. And, and in this case, you have an eight-year-old who's now head of, head of household. So just to put the numbers up there, to, to put this in perspective, um, there are an estimated 210 million orphans worldwide, including North America. Um, but notice that 143, so more significantly more than half, are in the developing countries of the world. And, and so I think when we think about what ethical framework makes sense for shaping policy, decision making, et cetera, you have to look at the global context. And so taking for granted that these kids come with families or that we can go out and find a grandmother or, you know, you just, I think you have to look at the bulk of, of the children who are, are in settings where you have no infrastructure. Um, the concept of social orphans is, is commonly used in, in global health, and just, this just means you're functionally alone in the world. Um, you, your parents, one or both, are living, um, but in the case I'll give you in a minute, um, you know, mom was an alcoholic and just wasn't present and wasn't functional as a mother. And for all intents and purposes, um, her young daughter was an orphan and was dropped off at an orphanage. Um, the causes, um, it continue, number one cause continues to be um, HIV and um, malaria, um, HIV, AIDS, and malaria. And um, when you look at the numbers in Africa, it, it really is um, heart stopping. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to, to what these numbers mean in, in a minute. Um, armed conflict, I mean, I think there's a lot of focus on HIV, AIDS, and AIDS orphans. Um, there's some imprecision in, in how we, we define the causes because there are a lot of additional infectious disease causes that are getting lumped in. Um, and a lot of these kids are, are also um, orphans of, of poverty, so it's more complicated. But armed conflict tends to be underplayed, and it's actually the number two cause for parental loss. Um, right now, the, the top hot zones are Iraq, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, and, and, and of course, uh, Sierra Leone. Um, the other silent but significant cause are socioeconomic reasons. So there was just a, an article um, in the New York Times um, as reporting on a study from the Soros Foundation looking at Romania. There's a group of children they call um, the strawberry orphans. So um, economically, Romania has been really hard hit, along with a lot of other countries in, in um, Eastern Europe and the former Balkans. And um, so parents are going to Italy, to Spain, to pick strawberries, to you know, take on domestic work jobs. And they're, they're leaving um, young children and teens at, at home alone. Um, both parents often go. Sometimes it's a single parent household and mom leaves. Um, and so the story that was in New York Times was really heartbreaking. It was about a suicide of a young boy who left a note for his mom who she had gone off to work and had come home briefly and left again and he just um, you know, couldn't, couldn't take the situation anymore. Um, and so there's a significant number that are orphans due to just socioeconomic pressures um, and the need for migration um, to find jobs. So to put a, put a face um, to the numbers, and, and this is um, not her name, but this was a, a young girl at the um, orphanage, the, the clinic run by UNICEF in, in Tomsk. 
Um, and I'll say more about how that, that program runs um, shortly. But um, Elena was 15 at the time, and she, got, as I mentioned, was a, was a social orphan. And Tomsk is a really industrial, um, was, a, was a former um, part of the gulag, the prison system um, in Siberia. And a uh, huge number of, of prisoners and also um, prostitution, um, high rate of alcoholism, and large... Um, orphanage system. Um, it's hard to get accurate numbers out of Tomsk, but th this is a clinic that UNICEF has set up as a shelter, um, but it's in tension with the official um, child welfare system. So Yelena is sort of caught in, in that system, and she came into the UNICEF clinic um, several times, and they offer just basic clinical screening. Um, they offer, they get have bath day, they get just very, very rudimentary, uh, safe place to go, safe place to sleep, place where you know your friends will be, and a place where you won't get turned in, which is key. Um, she tested negative for HIV, but positive for TB, and so they wanted to start her on um, combination therapy and first-line drugs, and obviously, directly observed therapy wasn't in the cards for she was working as a prostitute in Tomsk. Um, in the summertime, very, very hard to find any of these kids. They have a system of going out and finding them under the bridges. Um, and hard to get her to come in, hard to monitor um, her TB meds, and so she was, um, she was not adherent to her therapy. And in the process of their evaluation, she disclosed that she's actually showed some pride that she had become a more popular, more popular on the street um, and had moved up. She started out with this really awful morning slot, um, and the more powerful women on the street who have some clout, you know, sort of relegated her to this unpopular spot. She got the worst Johns, the dangerous ones, and, and they wouldn't wear a condom because um, they thought she was a um, not a virgin, obviously, but um, someone who wasn't HIV positive because she was younger. And so they didn't think they needed to wear a condom. Of course, it didn't occur to them that they were the delivery, <laughs> the vector. Um, so, so at this Point, and I'll come back to her case later, um, she was sent, she had been in and out of a state uh, facility, and the kids share their stories about the particular, one of the local um, facilities, and they describe it as a prison. I mean, their stories of the kids being scrubbed down and being locked in the rooms, and they absolutely fear it. And so one of their bargaining chips with the clinic is that, you know, they'll threat, they threaten to run and not to come back if you're going to turn them in. And, and there's a real challenge for the director because she's constantly being pressed for a list of names in the street corners where the girls work, et cetera. So that's... Um, Yelena's situation. So I just want to pose the question, and I gave Lainey a hard time because she um, left for her plane, and so I can't pick on her in her to her face. But um, what what exactly does pediatric uh, ethical theory have to say about these teens and about Yelena? And um, I think Lainey's account represents one of the most sort of well developed, robust, and practically uh, applicable. Um, theories for decision making in pediatrics. Um, it's a, you know, I think a wonderful way of thinking about the balancing of family interest and, and children. But I've asked her this several times, you know, what does she have to say about kids on their own? And she just said, this theory is not about them. Um, I don't know what to say about it. She might, she might now, we haven't discussed it for a while, but there's a big hole there, I think. Um, Nice collection um, by Jeff Bluestein and Carol Levine and others in New York. Um, this is a collection of um, the empirical data on, on sort of children on their own, runaways, homeless children, focusing on the U.S. And then it, they, their last chapter, they do have guidelines for decision making and care. Um, but just to say, say a little bit about it, um, let me go to that. One of the challenges is that they basically take principalism and try to apply it to kids on their own. And I think, I think it's strained. I mean, you can kind of see them straining to fit the empirical data of the challenges with their developmental capacities. And then what do we do with principal of beneficence? And, you know, what's special about these kids? And what do we need to think about? you know, with disclosure or confidentiality that's different. So it's not quite there yet. It's a wonderful start, but I think we have some serious questions about do the principles need to look different uh, when they're applied to kids who don't have the benefit of a family structure. And going back to Lainey's account, um, 
obviously the parentalist account just explicitly depends on at least some semblance of, of stable family, family structure. But I want to add a, an additional point which will help undergird um, the position I want to start to construct, which is it also, I think, assumes adequate social infrastructure of really critical child welfare institutions. Um, and again, going back to those numbers, if you've got the bulk of the children in the world living in parts of the world that completely lack public health infrastructure and lack um, child welfare institutes, uh, institutions, caseworkers, you know, all the machinery that goes with a fairly robust, if not perfect, um, and maybe even broken public health system, you know, it's hard to know how this is supposed to guide decision making with those kids when you lack those resources. Um, so this idea that we can rely on the law um, is problematic. So just as because we have just some talented legal thinkers in the room, um, I, I think that this is a critical um, piece of the puzzle, but it's, it's incomplete as well. And it's important, I think, we tend to say wards of the state in this country and think you know, that there's this monolith and it, you have to break it down and think, who am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about that guardian who has 20 other kids that she has to you know, go to court for or come into the hospital and help make decisions. Or I'm talking about the head of the orphanage who has 50 children and she's, got, she's the only one we can go to for consent in a research HIV vaccine trial. We're talking about people, you know, who represent the state interests in child welfare. And so I think there's work to be done on what are the ethical obligations for each of those critical surrogates in helping deliver health care to these kids. So what exactly is missing? Um, as I said, I think we're missing an understanding of the scope of the problem, um, and I'll say more about that in just a minute. Um, we, we really need to improve protection worldwide. So right now, the really red-hot alarm issues are trafficking, um, and surprisingly, property rights. A big issue throughout Africa is that these kids are losing what property they had. They have, a lot of them have enough to continue living on, and you have a head of household who's 12 or 13, and they have a house, and they have several animals, and they have a small plot where they can garden with the help of a distant aunt who comes in, and they lose everything when their parents die because there's no legal protection for their property, and it gets raided. Um, so that's a powerful example of where I think the law can be approved in, in these areas. The kids themselves um, really need stable, um, at least one adult in their lives, and, and I'll give you the data on this in, in just a minute. But what they're missing is trust in, in others for good reason, uh, self-esteem and confidence, um, understanding uh, our understanding them beyond the stereotypes. There's this tendency to, to throw on this label of vulnerability and not think about how that gets internalized. Um, I had one young um, student when I was going around the group and asking them what they wanted to, to be. And uh, he really, you know, they were saying, they were calling out rap singers, you know, there's this really popular Zambian rap singer named Ephraim, and like five of the boys wanted to be Ephraim, um, teacher, doctor, um, and this one little boy raised his hand and he said, OVC, which means orphans and vulnerable children, and it's the shorthand that UNAID and other aid organizations uses to offer assistance to families who take in or foster an orphan, and the fact that this young kid just thinks of himself as OVC and that's what he wants to be when he grows up was uh, was heartbreaking and makes you think about the unintended consequences of how we label. Um, so it's a multi-front challenge and I think looking at global health, looking at relationship-centered uh, care, human development, um, social justice and, and human rights, I think it's not a simple task, it's a sort of inter interdisciplinary project to think about how do we improve the support um, on the ground and the policy, protective policy for these kids. So these are the key components that I think we need um, moving forward. And in the time that remains, I want to take each one of these and just give you some practical examples of, of sort of what I have in mind. So visibility is a really powerful concept in social justice and, and global health. Um, being counted having your disease burden counted is not just a mathematical puzzle. It represents aid. It represents people being aware of your plight and intervening. So to improve uh, visibility, we need better epidemiological data on these kids' health problems at, at the population level. Um, and then I think we also need social science 
research that digs down a bit deeper and looks at the specific regional challenges and maybe even um, local challenges that these kids face. So I want to go back to those numbers that I put up. Um, rarely do you see such a wide degree of uncertainty. Um, plus or minus four million kids. However, you know, that's, um, there's, there's a huge gap there. We have um, a lot of these children remain invisible and uncounted in many countries. Um, similarly, when you look at the U.S. data, so you can't, you know, blame it on a, a lack of, of health data and infrastructure in the, in the public health and counting system. Um, you know, if you have plus or minus one million um, in, in the U.S. context, in a, in a um, you know, developed country context, um, this range of uncertainty, again, going back to the point I just made, these are kids that are on, whose plight is unseen. Um, and so if you're allocating uh, dollars for intervention and, and your head count is off, um, this, this just represents significant underfunding and, and lack of intervention. So we need to improve those data. Um, the other, we, we really need to, I think, also improve data on their specific health challenges. Um, undernutrition alone uh, and just the chronic illnesses that they present with, um, pulmonary illnesses actually are, are, are up near the top. Um, fever, cough, colds, um, they don't have their eyesight corrected. Um, they're not treated for the flu. They're just, they're basic um, childhood diseases that that would normally be treated, um, you know, even by by not well-off um, families in most countries are, are not being addressed. Um, no vaccinations, um, and then you have the the psychological and the the socio-affective components of either being abandoned or abused or or shuttled around from different uh, living situations, and all of these I think need more attention. And this is a challenging time to try to garner attention for, for their, their plight. Um, and then the other key issues are the substance abuse and um, behavioral risk, sexual risk. There's some really good research and local research being done um, on this. But the mental health challenges that these kids face are significant, and it's un these are untreated mental health um, issues. Um, so again, uh, these silences um, represent a significant burden on these kids that just aren't registering in our in our health ca healthcare system. So again, I want to bring you back down to the level of, of the individual child, and this is from a young girl, and it's not her in the, in the photo, um, who was in our group in the interview study. Um, we don't have a, a sense of the, of the magnitude and the, the depth and the long-term impact of rejection that these kids are experiencing and have internalized. Um, so she says, the, the day when I felt like I was rejected was the day when my mother died. Every one of her family did not want to accept me or keep me. Only one person of her family wanted to take me to the village with her. This person was her elder sister, but her younger sister refused. My father passed away in 2004, and in 2005, my mother also died. We were told to live with our aunt. Um, this is also a, another young girl. She began bringing men into our house. The men now try to rape my young sister when I'm not around. They try to do it to me, too. I feel neglected. There's no one to listen to my views. They do not show seriousness to us. It pains me and it disturbs my schoolwork. And this was unusual. Most of the kids will report abuse in the third person, so they'll describe either a sister, sibling, friend, cousin's abuse and not their own. And then with a little bit of support through the counselor, you'll find that it was actually her story. Um, in the plays that they performed for us also, that full of, of stories of, of abuse as a way of telling the story without telling their, their personal experience. Um, there's, this is also a, a public health issue. So throughout um, Lusaka, you'll see these billboards. So there's a widespread view throughout Central Africa, not just in Zambia, that sex with a virgin will cure HIV. Um, and so that is the number one leading cause of child abuse in Zambia still. And so here's another example where changes in the law have, have been helpful and they've increased the penalty um, and they've increased the age for defilement. It used to apply to younger children because they have such young threshold for marriage, and now they raised it up to 16 um, to try to capture those young girls in the middle, teenagers who had been raped, and, and there was no law against rape in that age category. 
So I think that paints a picture of, of why we need the second component, which is protection. Um, and here, I think it's, it's really important, again, to try to refine what we mean by vulnerability. I'm the last one to stand up here and say these kids aren't vulnerable, but I'm really frustrated with how vulnerability gets used as a concept um, in practice, in terms of policy, and then psychologically in how these kids think of themselves. So I think we need to start to tease out what we mean by vulnerability, and there's a movement in the social science research being done to specify vulnerability to what, susceptibility to what, and under what circumstances so that we can target interventions more effectively and not just blanketly call an entire population uh, vulnerable. Because with vulnerability comes a justification ethically for intervention, for paternalism, for taking over decisions. Um, it has a huge impact on these kids' lives, and so I think we, we need to understand their specific vulnerabilities and also their strengths. Um, one thing that we do know in terms of protection and trying to improve protection of kids on their own is that institutionalized care is, is hazardous to your health. And uh, we now know this is true across the board uh, internationally. Um, so a number of, of different studies, and I've got the references here if you're interested in, in digging into the, the details, um, but it's, it's well known that the experience, even short-term experience in an institutional setting, so by that I mean not just um, orphanages, but halfway houses um, or shelters, uh, institutions other than a, a fostering or family situation. Um, these kids end up in a cycle of socioeconomic, behavioral, and health problems as a result of that experience. Um, we also know that they tend to repeat that cycle, so in some of the longitudinal um, studies, they have higher rates of behavioral difficulties later on, they end up in the juvenile justice system, um, and they, they themselves may adopt behaviors uh, of abuse um, themselves. Um, we also know that infants and young children, so even though we're talking about teens uh, at this conference, um, you know, the ones that have come out of an institutionalized setting and are troubled and need intervention often have a story that began at birth um, or infancy or, or when they were toddlers or placed in an institution. We can better understand their behavioral challenges if we understand the conditions under which um, they lived and some of the, the uh, health outcomes and psychological impact that that, that life um, has for kids. So one thing, uh, just a striking um, piece of data, the studies on post-traumatic stress disorder are really, uh, really amazing. There's a recent um, study by Harvard Medical School and the KC programs, and we're looking at youth here in, in the Washington area and Oregon area between the ages of 19 and 30, and on a PTSD test, um, these kids demonstrated rates that were twice that of U.S. war veterans. There's a controversial um, series of studies that have been done um, in Romania, um, valuable longitudinal data on the effects of, of institutionalization on, on children. And one of the studies uh, emerging out of that series was an MRI study where they actually showed um, kind of atrophy and hypometabolism in the part of the brain that is responsible for um, affective disorders and for positively for connections, for affective connections. And you, it's one of those striking examples where everybody knows this and, and we've had this, the behavioral data for a long time, but to see the manifestation, the neurological manifestation of having your the center that's responsible for human connection um, atrophied and, and starved um, is, is really very moving and powerful as we think about how do we really fine tune our protection for these kids. The studies on truth telling and bereavement now sort of looking now um, towards some of the empowerment or, or the, the, the capabilities that some of these kids have, there's a tendency if we think of them as just vulnerable, not to tell them they have HIV, not to tell them that their parents died. You know, disclosure um, doesn't tend to be the norm. And um, there's an interesting study that came out on, on their a number of, of projects, but this one was a Zimbabwe study on bereavement. Um, so the practice, the local practice, or regional practice, was not to really talk about the parents' loss, and especially if the loss was due to HIV AIDS, it wasn't something that it was an embarrassment to the extended family and not something discussed with the children. And a lot of adults 
who had taken in these kids also just weren't prepared and didn't know how to handle this. So in the study, what they found was that the teens, as this is an interview study with the teenagers um, several years out, found that they actually preferred to know, that they knew what happened, and they preferred to have somebody be straight with them and have that conversation with them so that they could grieve, that they felt that they were being asked to be silent about something that they wanted to talk about. Um, and so they found also that having adults be part of that conversation was really critical. Um, and I think this, these data speak to the importance of thinking of them as, as people who, who you know, really are struggling with very difficult bereavement issues and needs, need our support and not, not silence. Um, a Seattle study looked at one of the other significant challenges when we think about improving protection for these kids, and that's simply improving access and continuity of care. Dimitri Christakis has looked at continuity of care issues here in, in Seattle, and in this study, they, they actually um, interviewed the kids and said, what are the, some of the challenges with coming to clinic or, or coming into the shelter, or you know, who provides your care? And a lot of the young girls said, well, self-care. You know, I'll go to another young girl and we'll try to you know, find somebody who has some antibiotics and we'll try to fix it ourselves, and then maybe we'll go in. Um, why don't you go in? Well, one of the sort of number one reasons or barriers was that they felt a lack of respect from providers. Um, that they were being judged and that their own self-knowledge even of their medical history wasn't being respected. Um, and that encounter they found so difficult that they didn't want to go back and so they would sort of do everything they could to take care of whatever illness they had um, before going in for, for help. Um, there's a, an interesting um, concept in psychology and de developmental liter literature called resilience, a uh, complicated um, concept, but, it, but I think an interesting one for this population. And roughly, it's this idea that um, it's a capacity for adaptation, successful adaptation, to a situation that would, under ordinary circumstances, lead to psychological dysfunction in, in most people. And so there's a real puzzle. We still, it's an open question, we don't know why some kids come through the absolute ringer and they do okay. Um, across the board, it's neurologically, we're not sure why some kids are resilient and others are not. That's a basic question. And it's now becoming a very nuanced, complex area of, of research. And I think this is a promising area for, again, improving our protection and interventions uh, for these kids. Um, and the, again, the, the trend here is to specify, 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 you know, not just look at resilience across the board as a kind of uh, monolithic concept, but to look at very specific factors that are protective uh, of, you know, certain, certain adverse circumstances and um, in, in which context. And I think as that data becomes available, become available, uh, we can use that to, to improve our inter interventions. I've talked already about um, behavioral risk, so I'm not going to go over that, but I wanted to mention this. I think one of the worst oxymorons I've ever encountered, uh, encountered is uh, survival sex. So this is sex for money, for, in our group, um, the real popular bartering is for talk time, which is just a card, the cell phones use cards, and it can be as much as the equivalent of $2 worth of cell phone time, air time. Um, and so what, what these young girls have um, of value are, are their bodies. And, um, and so again, as I, going back to Yelena, um, they're, they're with the worst possible clientele, as if they were good clientele. Um, but th the idea is that they're so desperate, and this is something, that's one power that they have, is the, is the small semblance of power that they have in, in, with their body, and they, can, and they can get food, they can get clothing, shoes, a place to live, um, somebody who watches out for them. Um, so this is just a critical, critical area for public health intervention um, for these clinics. And so as a result of, I think, those big dangers and, and risks, a lot of the programs that you see, intervention programs, clinics, halfway houses, especially in the global context, this is one where we work in, uh, the one in Tomsk, um, our harm reduction program, so harm reduction is the language that was used with needle exchange programs. And the idea is you don't judge the high risk behavior, um, but for the sake of public health and for sake of this particular individual's health, we're going to look the other way, we're going to give them clean needles, 
we're going to bring them in and, and not judge them so that they will come in for some, uh, some intervention. And so these programs are being implemented for these high-risk teens. Um, and I think they're critical. I mean, they're literally life-saving. But one thing I want to put out there just practically that happens is that they get entrenched as sort of the dominant program and the dominant way of thinking about these kids is harm reduction, that just basic, you know, um, let's try to do damage control. And with Elena, it was all about everybody in the clinic was, was saying, you know, she's still HIV negative. Like, this was just a huge accomplishment. And yeah, it was for her. Um, but I think there's something so troubling about that becoming our goal for Elena, that she, one more day, she's HIV negative. Um, so again, while these programs are, are just critical, I think they need to be balanced with an approach that, as I say, uh, aims a bit higher. So how do we address that kind of expectations gap? And what I mean is, um, in the kids' own minds, their expectations for themselves are low. In the healthcare workers' minds who staff the clinic, their expectations are low. In policy, if we see them as visible at all, um, our expectations are, are very low. And so one of the things I just want to put out there, I won't go into it um, here, is that I think Amartya Sen's work that he's done, this is a Nobel laureate in economics, who's done just remarkable work um, in human development, the capabilities approach, I think might be something worth trying to apply um, in thinking about these kids and how we might think about a, ro a more robust ethical framework. Um, and capabilities just very, very simply are the ability to do or, or be something. And, and there's a long list of you know, particular functions that are thought to be central to human functioning. So Sen's big idea was you know, don't look at GDP of a country and measure its worth that way. Look at its citizens and how many people's capabilities, basic functionings to do or be something, their positive freedoms um, to engage in the world, not their negative autonomy or, or something thinner than that. How many are lifted up? And that's the measure of a, of a solid civilization and a, and a wealthy country. So just something, something to, to consider. So I want to turn now to, to empowerment and how we think about trying to aim, aim higher when these, with these kids. And Pasteur said this, and notice that he said this about any child, not his own child. When I approach a child, he inspires in me two sentiments, tenderness for what he is and respect for what he may become. Caring and trust are critical, so I think in addition to the capabilities approach, the relationship-centered care approach, and going back to Leslie's point about creating community with, within the healthcare environment is, is really critical. We know that even one adult mentor, so one pediatrician possibly, one healthcare worker, one social worker, one nurse who spends a little extra time can make all the difference uh, with these kids in terms of, of, um, of their behavior, but also their self-esteem and and responsibility, going to school, et cetera. Um, so there are a number of experiments in social agency that are going on, and I just want to want to give you a couple of examples. Um, this is our uh, safe club in, in Lusaka at Mahatma Gandhi School, and it's a after school, these are schools that serve the poorest neighborhoods in the area, and a lot of the kids from the orphanages attend. Um, and it's just a support network that ties the different at-risk um, neighborhood kids together. Um, they have leaders um, that have gone through UNICEF training programs that lead the activities. And, you know, they're innocuous activities and fun activities like soccer, but there are also classes on, on um, safe sex and um, the importance of staying in school and um, training programs and, and other things. Um, but we use in these programs peer mentors, and so these are kids that have come up through the same neighborhood, have been through the same experience, and they have not only survived, but a lot of them are in college where they have a job and they've made it, made it through. And they've come back and volunteered their time um, with these kids to, to help run these, these programs. So it's an example of, you know, we worry about peer pressure. And this is an example of harnessing peer pressure. We know that peers are influenced more by peers than, a, than a, sorry, teens are influenced more by peers than their adults. Um, and this is a way in which you can harness that tendency toward good, double-edged nature, though. And we really need to, to make sure that those teen mentors go through a training program and are paired up with adults. And so the younger kids say to us, you know, I can trust them. Um, they've been where I've been. Um, they won't judge me. They'll help me. And 
if, if they've got the right tools and they've got a contact, an adult contact, who can um, give them the information they need or get the counselor they need or get the rape kit in, the hor in those hor horrible circumstances, they've got the backup, um, then this can be a very effective way of offering these, these kids support. This is Jacqueline um, Linga, who's our social worker on the project, um, and a beautiful example of, of somebody who just says to these kids, I believe in you, and she's also been there. Um, and these are what the kids say about her. She made me feel like I was someone important. She talked to me like I'm a person who matters in this world. And one young boy said, she scares me. And I said, why? Um, and she said, because I knew if I messed up, she'd be mad at me um, because I can do great things. And she'd take away my talk time, which is his cell phone time. Last, um, advocacy. Um, I caught him in Selma, Alabama, just, just after he announced he was going to run. And I was just beneath the podium, so that was, that was when he didn't have the Secret Service in front of him just yet. Um, so last, I just want to want to highlight a few key areas of advocacy for these kids and talk about who who the advocates might be. And advocates to me are the people who just say, "If not me, then who?" And I think for kids on their own, any adult who comes in contact with them. And again, going back to Leslie's lovely point about creating community within your adolescent clinic, I think it's so critical. And this is Yelena Borjanova, who's the pediatrician who donates. She's a full-time pediatrician, an expert in TB at the local clinic, and she donates her time to the kids at the UNICEF clinic and does all of the care uh, pro bono. And physicians in Russian Federation make about what kindergarten teachers do here. So. Um, Social workers, nurses, or just anyone who comes into contact with these kids, researchers, has a, have an opportunity, I think, to be mentors. Um, Maren Munson at, at Stanford is doing a wonderful project where she's documenting, she'll be talking about this at ASBH on our panel, um, community health worker, um, who's working in the West Bengal region with kids as community activists in both environmental activism and in public health efforts, where they're training the kids to go out into the communities and sort of shame the other adults into you know, not putting waste in the area where you're you know, watering your plants and all kinds of things. So you've got these bossy little kids running around you know, with public health messages. And what they're finding is how empowering this is for kids who otherwise would be at risk. Um, Journey for Change. If anyone didn't catch Black in America 2 uh, the other night, there's a, um, this is the CNN special. It's worth watching, and there's a wonderful program that's highlighted, um, and it's being conducted in Brooklyn. It's exchange between at-risk kids, many of whom are functionally alone uh, in, in, in the Brooklyn area, and they're being sent to South Africa and partnered with a group of South African kids in the townships outside of Cape Town and Johannesburg, and they're being asked to do volunteer work, and it's a contract that they sign for about a year. Um, and uh, it, it's just remarkable what it's done to them in terms of a transformation. They went from being receivers of help and aid to givers. Um, and that just that psychological shift of having somebody else say, you're responsible for these, this family. Go out and find out what they need and go get it is really quite, quite powerful. And this is a superstar at one of our schools at Koblanga, um, who's now, UNICEF has a digital uh, reporting program for kids, and it's a digital radio program. You can go online and listen to the kids' reports. Um, and it, she's, she reports on children's rights issues within Lusaka and Zambia. And again, just, you know, it's remarkable to see her in action interviewing, um, you know, hum, hum, adult human rights advocates and putting together feature stories for the local radio station about the kids' plights, et cetera. It's, it's really something. So I want to end by um, going back to the kids at Mahatma Gandhi School in Lusaka where we've been working. Um, we, uh, my medical student Roshan Patel and I made t-shirts for the kids and we got, had, let them choose what they wanted to put on the shirts and so they decided to go with their namesake. Um, and so on the back of the shirts it says, be the change you want to, to see in the world from, from Gandhi. And um, I, just, I just want to close by saying I, I don't, I, don't want to sound pie-eyed about these kids. I mean, I really do appreciate just how complex their predicament is. Um, that said, we have a real opportunity here, and I think 
Um, it's a shame to, we certainly need to see them. We need to open our eyes and realize that they're all around us. Um, but I think also it's a shame to just blanketly write them off as the lost generation. I've lost track of how many papers there are, books that are called the lost generation. So African music is now filled with that line, the lost generation of the lost boys of Sierra Leone. Um, they're not lost, and I think in addition to protection, to targeted protection, savvy targeted protection, they also need empowerment and they need the tools to fly. And um, if given that, I think a lot of them, a lot of them will. So thank you very much.